Om Aganati Maranda Sangana Gana Sadaka Chaksuru and Militam Yanatash Mahi Sri Gribe. Om Aganati Maranda Sangana Gana Sadaka Chaksu. Si Chetanimano Vishnam Stapitam Yanabutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Darati Swapanantikam. Vanaham Sigiru Sieta Parakamanam Shigurun Vaishnavamsha Si Rupam Sagadatam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sadevam. Sadvaitam Sabadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sirada Krishna Padan Sahagana Larita Shibishikan Bitam Stam Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Deva Maheshara Guru Shaksha Parabram Tashma Shri Guru Venma Durga Me Pati Me Andasha Skarapate Shaki Bayas and Andaru Santu Santu Rambaram Ukum Gavi Pekari and Sabarish Marine Panga Gilanga de Dekarigane Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dino Bandu Jigapate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Jayatam Surito Pango Mam Mandir Madir Gadi Matsavasha Parambo Jarada Namaram Seaman Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsi Vada Karsan Benyosha Nirbaga Gopanata Surya Saram Divyad Vrindarani Kapadumara Srimad Radnagara Shima Shanishto Shri Shri Radha Shida Govinda Prasada Bihe Seba Manush Marami Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Taya Chaji Gadi Taya Krishna Go Vinaya Namona Namo Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shri Mari Bhakti Paranta Shami Namaste Sarasati Deva Guru Vani Pachari Nirvishes Sanyu Vari Paskata Desan Sri Krishna Taitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sati Go Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Welcome to Transcendental Tuesday, Rob on Zoom, Jean, <clears throat> Brent, Rakesh, and those yet to come still on Facebook. We're picking up where we left off in the 44th verse, 8th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam yesterday. We had ended up that uh, session by quoting Narada Muni, who explained that all paraphernalia of the cosmic universe is just an emanation of the various energies of the Lord. Parasha Shaktir Vividaiva Suryate. He's the remote cause, the one who has set everything into motion, but he himself is separate. It's like you can push the play button on a tape recorder and then walk away from it. And then the tape recorder is manufactured in such a way that once you push the play button, it knows what to do. So similarly, the Lord, his energies are full of knowledge and full of power, shabhavaka, bala, jnana, kriyaha, and full of ability, knowledge, power, and expertise. So all the Lord has to do is give the word, glance over it, say the word, set it in motion, and then it knows what to do automatically. How this all happens is inconceivable to our tiny brains, but it is the Lord who starts things off, and as a result of his nod, they're coming to be in all the actions and reactions of this vast cosmic manifestation. Everything is but coming from his energy, everything that is manifested in this temporary phenomenal world rests upon his energy and then after annihilation all that energy merges or is retracted back into him just like a spider after the purpose of its web has been finished consummated the spider retracts all the filaments of that web back into his abdomen so the spider and the web are non-different the web is but the energies of the spider but at the same time, the spider is aloof and different from that web. That when the web ceases to exist, the spider is there. Before the web existed, the spider was there. Similarly, Narada Muni says, Aham evasham nanyachat pasharam yo shows me hum. Before there was any manifestation in this material world, before there was a sun, moon, stars, demigods, the great sages, the marishis, the constellations, there was only Krishna. So when it is said, advancement of knowledge is applied in the service of the Lord. After many, many births and deaths, one who finally comes to the level of knowledge, he realizes that there is nothing 
but Vasudev. And once that realization comes, what is the conclusion? One surrenders fully unto Vasudev with his mind, his bodies, and his words. Therefore, it is said that the true scientists, the true philosophers, the true artists, the true people of knowledge dedicate themselves 100% in the glorification of the Lord. And when you look throughout cosmic history, not the petty history of nations and self-serving population, but you look at the big picture, you see that all the sages, all the saints, all the devotees have engaged themselves in serving the Lord according to the talents and abilities that they've been awarded, whether it be art, science, philosophy, physics, chemistry, psychology, whatever branches of knowledge there may be, they should wholly and solely be integrated and applied in the service of the Lord. Art, literature, poetry, painting, everything. When Prabhupada came to Australia, I don't know if it was the first or second time, he had this little book with him. It had just been published by Sruf Damodar. Sruf Damodar had a PhD in chemistry from Emory University. It's called The Scientific Basis of Krishna Consciousness. Prabhupada showed it to everybody, any cleric, any social worker, any lawyer, anybody with whom Prabhupada met. First thing he would do would give them a copy of that book. He was so proud of that achievement by his scientifically qualified disciple, Sruf Damodar. Well, we're going to talk today about how that principle is applied in the return of Krishna to Dwarka. He had spent time with the Pandavas in their capital city, Hastinapur, enjoying their friendship, their association. Queen Kunti has just tendered her prayers to Krishna as he departs from Hastinapur to finally reunite with the Yadu family members in the fortress Dorka, which is just off the Gujarat Peninsula, built within the sea. The last um, statement having to do with the meeting between Kunti and Krishna is that when Kunti finished her prayers, when she wound down, it is said, Pritayetam Kalapadai Pratirokana Mandam Jahasha Vaikunto Moham Ivamaya. Krishna smiled at Kunti, and it says that smile was more deeply satisfying in the heart of Kunti. It consumed more of her being on every level, mental, intellectual, spiritual, than even the presence of Vaikuntha. To hear or to see Krishna's smile upon her was more important to Kunti, and in fact, it's generally more important to all pure devotees than it is to even achieve liberation and go and live with the Lord in his own abode. When Ram was reinstalled after 14 years of exile and adventures, he came back, Bharat returned the crown to Ram. He sat on the throne, presided over his citizenry like a father presides over his loving children. The interesting thing is that the first thing Ram did was he sent his brothers out away from him. They were sent in the different directions, north, south, east, and west, in order to consolidate the kingdom and make sure that all the outlying kings paid tribute and recognized that Ram was the sovereign of all of them. You would have thought he would have kept his brothers, those highest, most elevated devotees, close to him. But in fact, he showed special mercy upon them by sending them away so that they could be engaged in his service, to be engaged in the service of the Lord is more important to the devotees than getting the Lord's association directly. I was reading something on the Krishna's Mercy podcast this morning. They send a subscription also. It says that while it's more important to serve the Lord and to execute the orders of the Lord, and that goes also for the sp spiritual master, there's no harm in getting the personal association. If the spiritual master is visiting, then go and see him. If, God, if Ram is sitting on the capital seat, then go and see him. But if Ram orders you to go far afield to distant provinces and, be found, and, and 
be physically separated from him, don't hesitate because Bani is also always more important than Vapu. To follow the orders of the Lord is more important to be in the physical presence. It's no harm to take advantage of the physical presence whenever it's available. Um, but at the same time, it's more important to follow the orders of the Lord. And the devotee drives more satisfaction from glorifying the Lord and seeing the Lord's smile of pleasure upon them than they would having taken up residence personally in Vaikuntha. It says that smile was more attractive, more fulfilling, more enchanting even than Krishna's mystic power. Now, as we move further into the Bhagavatam, Krishna returns to Dwarka. We find this verse in the 11th chapter of the first canto of the Bhagavatam. Nata Nartaka Gandavar. Gandavar are the singers. Nata Nartaka are the actors. We just did a series of, I think, 24 shows on Krishna as the consummate actor, as the ultimate actor. But wherever you see someone with acting talent, it's to be presumed that comes from Krishna. Because nobody is a better actor than Krishna. Krishna acts as the son of Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj. He acts as the friend and brother of Balaram. He acts as the lover of the gopis, the friend of the gopis. In, at any given moment, Krishna is playing uncountable millions and trillions of roles exactly according to the inner desires of his devotees' hearts. So all acting talents and abilities originate in Krishna. So when we're gifted with that same talent, it should be used in the service of Krishna. And that's what we see unfolding here with the triumphal welcome of Krishna back to Dwarka city. Nata nartaka gandha suta magada vadanam gayanti chotamashoka chariti abhutani cha. Dramatists, artists, dancers, singers, who are all in the sudra category, artists, dancers, singers. They're in the sudra, the craftsmen, the tradesmen category. Then coupled and combined with that class of men also doing their part in welcoming Krishna triumphantly back to Dwarka city are historians, genealogists. Why gene genealogists? Because they're singing the generations and generations of Yadus, glorifying the past generations, the, the ancestral kings, their activities, which all of which sets a, a tone for the current generation. It sets a bar, it sets a standard of virtue and protectiveness and leadership that then the current generation is uh, pressured in order to follow. So there are genealogists, there were historians, as well as learned speakers, all of whom gave their contributions. Everybody from the Sudra to the Vaishya, to the warrior, to the Brahmins, they were all, according to their own level, inspired by the superhuman pastimes of the Lord. So they went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So just uh, as we have today, dramatists, we have actors, we have historians, we have dancers, we have singers, we have genealogists, especially in Utah, we have public speakers. Similarly, apparently even 5,000 years ago, there were all those various talents and abilities distributed amongst the general population, but there was one difference. Every quality was turned towards glorifying the Lord. People did not take those qualities, those gifts, and use them for their own promotion, to massage their own egos. And if we look at the history of greater India, the Mahabharata history, the history of the Puranas, we'll note that they were not in chronological order. The historical facts are described not by chronology, not by sequence, not by the dates, but by the different superhuman pastimes of the Lord as they were exhibited in different ages, in different planets, in different times, and in different circumstances. 
considering that the purpose is to honor and glorify the Lord. The chronology is not important. When the Europeans first came to India and they stumbled upon what they thought was a hodgepodge of stories from the various Puranas, they couldn't catch up the historical link. They couldn't understand the dating of it. For some reason in the Western mind, it's not real until you date it. <laughs> Neither could they understand or accept that many of these activities or pastimes took place on other planets. Neither did they have an expansive enough idea of time in order to accommodate these stories. Christian idea at that time, and even up into the present moment, there was a Bishop Usher who went through all the biblical statements, collated them, did a rather thorough job, incidentally. And based on what he called from the Bible, he wrote his conclusion, which was generally accepted in the Christian world a thousand or so years ago when the missionaries were first entering in India, that the world was created on a Friday afternoon about 4,400 years ago. So when you believe the world is a measly 4,000 years old, it's not going to be very easy to accommodate stories that are reported to have been millions and millions and millions of years old. And the Lord is appearing on schedule time and time again. Of course, there are vast intervals of time in between his appearances, but he does appear regularly within the vastness of cosmic time. And when he appears as the boar, or he appears as Parasaram, or he appears as the Buddha, um, each appearance is similar to the other appearances, but at the same time, there are dissimilarities as well. The Lord is a sentient being. There are an unlimited number of variables. The Lord is never predictable. He's never mundane or routine in the way he deals with situations. He always has fresh approaches. He always acts according to new seasons and new circumstances. And so, although on the one hand, the Lord is constantly reappearing, constantly um, setting things right, according to one time a boar, according to one time a half man, a half lion, according to one time a tortoise. Still, none of the pastimes are set in stone. Everyone is unique and individual. <clears throat> so unauthoritatively and unimaginatively, the Western commentators have basically relegated all the stories of Purana to the level of mythology. <clears throat> when Pritamaraj was coronated, he also used this word Uttama Shloka to describe the Supreme Personality of God and one who is glorified with choice, poetry, and verses. In the fourth canto of the Bhagavatam, Yad Uttama Shloka Mahan Mukachuto Bhavad Padambuja Sudha Kana Nira Shmitam Purna Vishmita Tatva Vartanam Kuyogam Yo Virjati Dalam Bharai. My dear Lord, you are glorified by selected verses uttered by great personalities, such glorification of your lotus feet is just like saffron particles. And when the transcendental vibration from the mouths of great personalities carries the aroma of the saffron dust of your lotus feet, and that aroma enters the ears. Notice the peculiarity here. Normally, we perceive aroma through the nose. But when it comes to the Lord and his pure devotees, the senses become non-differentiated. Those who have uh, matured their full-fledged spiritual body within this material body through serving of the Lord, they know no limitations on their senses. They can smell with their spiritual ears. They can speak with their spiritual eyes. And therefore, it is said that when the aroma of the saffron dust enters the ears of the devotees, they gradually remember their eternal relationship with you and tears of ecstasy flow down their cheeks. All it takes is to be orally receptive. Open up the ears 
And if one will open up the ears and hear the glories of the Lord from the mouths of such swan-like devotees, all impure things, all distractions, all misconceptions within the heart are cleared away. And the result of hearing is that one comes to the correct conclusion about the position of the Lord, about the value and purpose of one's life. It is always and consistently prayed by the devotees when they're asked, give, asked to request any benediction whatsoever, they come back again and again and again and again. My Lord, I do not need any other benediction but the opportunity to hear from the mouth of your pure devotees. We quoted Marj Parikit yesterday at the very last phase of his life. He said, Punascha Bhagavati Anante Rati Prashangashtara Mahasu Yam Yam Maitriya Stashabatra Namo Dvijabya. He says, I only want, I only want the sages to continue chanting the glories of the Lord, just as we are now sitting on the bank of the Yamuna, hearing and chanting and glorify the Lord. I want to be in that same spiritualized surcharged environment wherever I may appear in my next life. It may be in heaven, it may be in hell, but my only desire is to continually have the transcendental vibrations from the mouths of pure devotees entering into my heart because that will always keep me in touch, that will always keep me awake and aware and in contact with the Supreme Personality of God. Outside of hearing from the mouths of pure devotee, it's almost impossible in material existence to be unaffected by the influence of the illusory energy of the Lord. All living beings have more or less forgotten their position as parts and parcels of the Lord. Uh, it says, John Madhya Shaya Tahan Avayatara Shura Tejo Vardi Midam Tatavi Nimaya Tri Sharga Misham. Even the great sages and the demigods, they have been duped into accepting this material world as real. And so powerful is the Lord that even this inferior material manifestation, because it comes from Him, can be accepted as the real thing. So it's like a sleeping man. You cannot convince a sleeping man that what he's experiencing in the dream is real. He's actually lying in Spanish work, Utah, in his bed, um, but he thinks he's flying through the air. He thinks he's being attacked by a tiger. He, there may be so many identities, so many scenarios that he spins out in the mode of ignorance while he's sleeping. And he's hardly aware of the fact of who his daytime body is, what his daytime identity is, and where his residence is. Similarly, each and every one of us is affected by the illusory potency of Maya. We think we're black, white, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, or Jew. And the purpose of associating and hearing about the glories of the Lord is to wake us up. Just like if you want to wake up a sleeping man, you do it through sound vibration. John, John, get up. You're sweating. You're crying out. Your eyes are going back and forth. You're all entangled in the bed sheets. Please, please get up. I want to relieve you of the suffering and the misconceptions under which you're laboring in this dream situation. And therefore, Bhaktivinoda.org. He says, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gora Chanda Bole. Wake up, wake up, sleeping soul. Get up and resume your eternal nature, resume your eternal occupation of de devotional service so that you may make this human form of life success. These awakening voices come through the mouths of pure devotees. Says Mukto Pidavad Birbiacha Deham Arajamashmam and Miman Yatana Bhutamba Piracha Kim to Anyaya Guhaya Gunavite. In by normal means, under ordinary circumstances, using the limited senses that we have, it's impossible to be free from the entangling illusion of mind. 
it's impossible to separate our identity as differentiated from matter, from darkness, from temporality. Only when we are fortunate enough to have coming down into our dreamlike state, the powerful words of a pure devotee, can we have any chance of waking up and coming to a higher state of consciousness? Consider the situation of Bharat Maharaj. As far as material affluence, there wasn't anybody that we could cite more fortunate than Bharat Maharaj. Bharat Maharaj was so fortunate, gifted, and favored materially that this earth planet is in fact named Bharat Barsha. Even today, the Hindi and Sanskrit words for India are Bharat, Bharat Varsha. Bharat ruled over all of that. He had a beautiful wife, a beautiful kingdom. He was a young man, very powerful and very strong. And yet, in the prime of life, Maharaj Bharat gave up everything because he was more fond of serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Uttama Shoka. Gave up his wife, gave up his children, gave up his friends, gave up enormous empire, which basically consisted of the whole world. Why? Because as attractive as all of that was, he was more attracted to the process, glorifying and honor the name, form, qualities, and pastimes of the Lord. A pure devotee following the footsteps of Bharat Maharaj can give up everything within this material world in order to take up the process of glorifying the holy name, form, and pastimes of Lord. In that sense, Bharat Maharaj is an example. He has a standard bear for an ideal king. That uh, for glorifying the Lord, he can, even the emperor of the world, can give up everything. Although he possessed all the opulences of the material world, Krishna was so attracted that he attracted Maharaj Bharat to give up all of his material possessions. So there's a verse also that Bharat Maharaj echoes in which the word Uttama Shloka is contained. Uttam means the best, and Shloka means reputation. Krishna is Aishurya Shamagasha, Virya Shaya, Yanavera, Shanambhagam, Itingara. Krishna is effulgent. Krishna is resplendent in six opulences wealth, strength, fame, beauty knowledge and renunciation whatever there is which is attractive whether it be wealth or whether it be beauty whether it be learning knowledge whether it be humility whatever there is which is attractive in this material world krishna is millions and millions of times more attractive in as much as everything originates from him krishna is among other things called yashasha the most famous. His reputation has extended throughout all of cosmic history. It's not limited to this planet. It's extant on other planets. It's more or less the full-time pastime of saints and sages and liberated devotees of the Lord. And we have the opportunity to join in that cosmic symphony, that cosmic chorus by following the footsteps of our spiritual master. I heard a story once about a missionary who went to a primitive place, never seen Westerners before, in New Guinea. The missionary had had some medical training before he took up uh, the missionary life. He came to this village, which he had his residence, but the peculiarity of this village was that um, the young men, whenever they'd reach their late 20s, 28, 29, 30, they would be struck with blindness. Nobody knew whether it was environmental, whether it was, nobody knew why. But when they would reach coming up to the age of 30, they would all go blind. Their parents had experienced that, their grandparents had experienced that. The missionary went around throughout the flora and fauna, made various potions, experimented here and there and ministered them to the young men, the current generation who age gradually 26, 
27, the, minister, the missionary is um, giving them these medications and these potions and all. They come 28, 29, nothing happens, 30, 31. And after some time, it dawned on the members of the village that whatever it is um, that had cursed the village, had cursed each successive generation with blindness, the, the manipulation or the expertise or the trial and error of that missionary had some or other caused the current generation to skip that fate which had befallen all previous generations. And their gratitude knew no bounds. They called that missionary up in front of the tribal council and they spoke to him in the following way. They said that we, we have this immense gratitude for you, but there is no word for thank you in our lexicon, in our language. So we are going to express our gratitude to you by whomever we meet, whatever tribes, whatever tradesmen, wherever we travel, distant villages, we are going to spread your name. We're going to spread your name and fame as far and wide as we can. And that's the spirit of the devotees. And especially important, influential personalities, individuals in this material world, it's their job that wherever they go, whether it be in the area of science or philosophy or art or academics or music, it's our prime job to make sure that everybody has heard about Krishna, especially at the present moment when there's such a lack of God consciousness. <clears throat> when Prabhupada first arrived in America, he was challenged at a public forum, hand was raised, question asked, and we have so many churches, so many denominations in America, why, why do we need another one? What is the necessity of Krishna consciousness? And Prabhupada said, you need Krishna consciousness because in spite of all the denominations and all the churches, you've forgotten God. The tried and true method to remember God. Krishna Padilla say Jiva Bahir, Ataiva Maya Tare De Samsadaga. The tried and true method of remembering God in the Bhakti Rasamri to Sindhu, the nectar devotion, the question is asked Can you consistently and regularly chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, and not revive your dormant God consciousness? Can you chant? and not become God conscious? And the answer is, no, you can't. It's quite obvious. You can't chant the names of God, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, which is a bona fide name of God, means all attract, and not become God consciousness. It's so simple, so obvious. And yet the value of this movement to propagate the chanting of Hare Krishna is pretty much missed by the majority of people. In fact, not only do they miss the great opportunity, which is presented by chanting Hare Krishna, but oftentimes they criticize it as a waste of time. However, it often happens that in criticizing the Hare Krishna movement, they end up inadvertently spreading the name and fame of Krishna. I remember in Melbourne, Australia one time, a newspaper reporter, came to visit Prabhupada. He wasn't a very intelligent man. He didn't ask very penetrating questions, but Prabhupada spent a lot of time with him. I couldn't understand why Prabhupada was spending so much time with him because he seemed kind of a duller. Prabhupada explained everything in detail. The next morning, Prabhupada told me to go out and get the paper. I went out to the newsstand, I got the paper, I opened it up, said, the headline is, Swami says it will become animal next life. That newspaper reporter had just taken what Prabhupada told him, all the care, all the concern, all the instruction that Prabhupada had personally given him, which is, which is invaluable. You know, and he just twisted it to make some sort of sensationalistic, misleading newspaper headline and article. So I went back in the room and I kind of had the paper behind my back. Prabhupada said, so? Yes, Prabhupada. Did you get the paper? Yes, Prabhupada. Where is it? I said, 
uh, oh, oh, probably it's right here. <laughs> so he said, but I said, Prabhupada, he kind of twisted what you said. This is the, Prabhupada said, what is the title? I said, Swami says it become Adam on his next life. And Prabhupada didn't get hung up on that. He didn't take it as an insult. He didn't take it personally as I had taken it. Right away, he said, how many times is Krishna, the name Krishna in the article? I counted. I think it was like 12 times. What is the circulation of this paper, the Melbourne Age? I thought it was one or 200,000. So what is the, how many times was Krishna's name spoken this morning in the city of Melbourne? That was a success. Prabhupada considered that even though the person was criticizing our movement, making fun of our movement, downplaying our movement, still could not avoid spreading fame of Krishna. It is one of the opulences of the Lord, which even the critics, even the atheists can participate in. If you recall in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the Kazi sent one of his men out to check on Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan movement. Lord Chaitanya's people would go chanting throughout the streets of Navadvi. And the caste conscious Brahmins started criticizing. They thought that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was preempting Hinduism, that, the, that if every man, woman, and child could have access to God by the simple process of chanting Hare Krishna, then people would be less dependent upon the Brahmins as intermediaries, as intercessionaries. And this would cause the income of the caste conscious Brahmins to shrink and dwindle, being concerned that they would no longer be maintained in the style to which they were accustomed. These caste conscious Brahmins went to complain to the Kazi and the Kazi sent one of his men to follow the Sankirtan movement and report back to him. And when that Kazi's man came back to him, the Kazi said, the Hare Krishnas are chanting Hare Krishna throughout the streets of Navadvi. Wherever they go, the Hare Krishna mantra resounds everywhere in the apartments, in the streets, and the people who are passing by on uh, walking or with horse-drawn chariots, they're responding by chanting Hare Krishna. And thus the Hare Krishna resonates back and forth, waxes and wanes as the whole city is full with the joyous sound of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. And Kazi's listening to all this with a kind of quizzical look on his face. And then he says, I can understand why the Hindus are chanting Hare Krishna, but why are you chanting Hare Krishna? Why is every other word coming out of your mouth, Hare Krishna? And the answer is that the glorification, there's nothing higher. As we said yesterday, there's nothing more enchanting in all of the three worlds than the glorification of the Lord from the mouths of pure devotee. When Lord Chaitanya was on the planet, wherever he went, uh, immediately people would be ignited with enthusiasm for chanting the glories of the Lord. He would go to a village and just by seeing him, Yanhara Darshana Mukya, Aisha Krishna, just by seeing his face, people would spontaneously burst into the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. And once having that taste, they could never give it up. The question is asked, how, having once tasted the nectar of honey from the lotus feet of the Lord, could anyone ever go back to their mundane, temporal, limited, predictive, material existence? The, the glories of the Lord from the mouths of pure devotees are more enchanting even than the abode of the Lord himself. And from his side, Krishna says, aham atmanam naham mad bhakta samadarshinaham sat chantadikam abham mante sham paramam param. Krishna himself says that without the presence of pure devotees, 
singing his glories and without the opportunity from Krishna's side to smile, to indicate, to transmit his satisfaction upon them by smiling. Without that give and take, Krishna says, the opulence and wealth and majesty of Vaikuntha hold no attraction for me. The wealth of Vaikuntha from Krishna's eyes is the pure devotees chanting his glory. Without that element in the spiritual world or in the material world, wherever it may be, Krishna takes no pleasure in his supreme position, his unlimited opulences. And so let us all join in following the pure devotees, seek the association of pure devotees, and in that association, take up the highest occupational duties of the living being, make our lives successful. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you, Sundari Priya. I noticed you posted a link to yesterday's talk on WhatsApp. I hope that means that you enjoyed it. And we're following up on that theme here also today. Satya Narayan Vashista, thank you for joining us as well. Hare Krishna to you. Hare Krishna back to you. <clears throat> Bye, Bobby. Smiley face. Manasa Ganga. Rakesh Raghava. Thank you all for being part of our Facebook presence, Jean, Brent, some words from Rob, if you can hear me out there. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, can you hear me? Yes, very plain, plain and loud. Excellent. So my takeaways today are bhakti is the science on which we have total reliance. <laughs> the Lord is never mundane, average or plain. <laughs> when the Lord's glories reach the ears, a pure devotee is brought to tears. This world is a false reality. The pure devotee will help you see. You're uh, particularly blessed by the muse this morning. It's all because of you, Prabhuji. <laughs> then I'm very fortunate. Then I'm very fortunate. How many was that? Four or five? Uh, four. You're going to send them to me? Yes, Prabhuji. Okay. I didn't get one yesterday, and then I'd forgotten what it was, so I didn't include it yesterday, but I'll look forward to including all four of those today. Those are excellent. Right on, right on, the, right on the point of discussion. Okay, that's it. It's uh, 14 minutes past the hour. Everybody, I assume, has Krishna conscious service to perform. Everybody has to take the name of Krishna and some or other insert it in the ears of your co-workers, your family members, your cl the clerks, the parking attendants that you might meet today, <laughs> some or other, spread the name and fame of Krishna because that's the perfection of the human form of life. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hari, hari.